start off by asking a very important question. Are you a casual or committed follower of Jesus? That seems like a harmless question, but how you answer it will either have zero impact on your life or it will completely and utterly affect every aspect of your day-to-day living. Matthew chapter 4 shows Jesus calling the first of his disciples, and these verses seem at first glance to be very comfortable and non-threatening and safe, but we'll see that they're not at all. Jesus is taking a stroll along the Sea of Galilee. He comes upon some fishermen, and he asks them to follow him, and they do. And yet somehow, by verse 24, the apparently ordinary becomes the extraordinary. And sometimes we read these words and we think to ourselves, that's nice, I don't feel threatened or offended by this, or, you know, those guys gave something up, something they were doing, maybe even something that their uh, livelihood depended on, upon, but I've never really enjoyed fishing anyway, so I feel pretty secure in that. But we probably don't know is that between the account of the calling of the first four disciples, this Peter and Andrew and James and John, and a few verses later, News had spread all over Syria and large crowds from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan are coming to see Jesus. So there is nothing ordinary about what's happening here. It's radical and at the very heart of this entire series of events is the notion of discipleship. Remember that discipleship is being a committed follower of Jesus is a key theme of the whole of Matthew's Gospel. And uh, Matthew's Gospel wraps up in chapter 28 with the great commission of Jesus to go and make disciples. So the recipients of Matthew's Gospel, that includes us, are meant to read these events and question what it means to be called by Jesus. In the first century, the idea of disciples was very common. For example, rabbis would have had disciples. But what's different about Jesus' followers is that normally people would shop around for and decide if they wanted to follow someone. But Jesus, he chose them. He called these men and and by following, not only were their lives changed, but the entire history of the world has changed. And here's something that's truly remarkable. Just as Jesus called some people 2,000 years ago, he's still calling people today. He's calling you to follow him with your all. So let me ask you something. What are you known for by people? And what's the defining characteristic that people know you by? Is it your good looks? Are you funny? Are you maybe the super athlete in your group? Or maybe your intelligence defines you or your money. But what if the defining characteristic of who you are was being a committed follower of Jesus? If we want to understand what that means, we've got to examine the call of Jesus. So just preceding our passage this week, we're reminded that the heart of Jesus' proclamation to repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. This is very good news. It's the gospel. We see that repeated again in verse 23 with the report that Jesus went throughout all Galilee teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news, that's the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. So Jesus is explaining with the scriptures what the kingdom of God is all about and he's demonstrating with miracles and with healing what the kingdom of God looks like, proclaiming this good news and inviting people to be a part of it. The Greek term for the gospel is not just something used by Jesus. For example, we can see inscriptions from from the ancient world that begin with the words such as the gospel of Caesar Augustus that would concern the birth or coronation of a new ruler or some sort of victory that's been won. The point of the gospel is, is that this is an announcement, an event that has taken place which has changed everything. Something has been done for you that changes your life. But Jesus' proclamation of the gospel is radically different. It's a gospel of grace. And this is very different because whilst other religions pretty much say that in order to be saved, you need to do X, Y, and Z, the gospel says that the victory has already been won. And that because of Jesus, you're invited to take hold of this new reality. So at the heart of following Jesus is the news that there's a new world coming, free from pain, suffering, disease, hunger, poverty, and death. There's a new world coming in which all relationships will be restored because your relationship with God has been made new. And it has nothing to do with your efforts, but everything to do with this new king, Jesus. The call of Jesus is different than any other call because it's the call of grace. And we see that with the call of the first disciples, it says, come follow me and I will make you fishers of men, Jesus said. And at once they left their nets and and followed him. The tone with which Jesus calls has an immediate sense. And we see that reflected in their response. They immediately leave what they're doing and they follow Jesus filling these fishing quotas that 
uh, Rome probably would have been uh, the basis for their family's livelihood, but they left that behind and they followed Jesus. We probably balk a little at the concept of Jesus' call interrupting our paycheck and priorities, but the real impact for these men would have been saying goodbye to their parents. Zebedee, the, the father, in one call from Jesus loses his workforce, his retirement plan, and his family members, his sons. And Jesus asserting priority even over their families is this radical concept, especially in this traditional culture. And that's exactly what he does, and there's nothing moderate about this call. Just think for a moment about what Jesus says in Luke 14. It says, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and his mother and his wife and his children and his brothers and his own sisters, yet even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Now when you know that Jesus is not saying that you literally hate your family, after all, he commands us to love our enemies. No, he's saying that I want you to love me so comprehensively that all other attachments looks like hate in comparison. So what does that mean for us? It means that following Jesus involves a break with the old loyalties, whatever that looks like for each person may vary, but at the heart of responding to the call will be a radical reorientation of our individual priorities. Just as Jesus' call completely disrupted priorities, social and economic obligations of two households, the call of Jesus disrupts our lives too. And like I said last week, if someone offers you Christianity without adversity, they're lying to you. Conversely, if there's any condition on our following of Jesus, like, I'll follow you, Jesus, if you do this or don't do this or if I can lose this but not that. And that's not the case if that's your true master. So following Jesus is traditionally countercultural, but a lot of people are interested in Jesus on their own terms. And they like this. They want to keep Jesus at arm's length. But Jesus isn't asking for casual followers, like you would follow your favorite celebrity on Instagram or uh, calls on Facebook. A casual follower of Jesus is someone who wants to be close enough to Jesus to get the benefits, but not so close to require sacrifice. Jesus is looking for completely committed followers. Jesus doesn't say, come follow me and I will leave you exactly as you are either. He says, come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. I will transform you. I will release you and enable you to take part in the most amazing endeavor that the world has ever known. It will change you just like the disciples, but will also change the world. You'll no longer live for yourself. You'll be fishers of men. And that means that one of our key tasks is to draw men and women into the kingdom of God, telling people about Jesus, showing people with our lives. It's a core characteristic of following Jesus. Many of us think that we are not natural evangelists, but actually, if you follow Jesus, you are a fisher of men. If we want to be the greatest fishermen for Him, we've got to keep our eyes on Jesus so that that means as individuals, we should always be growing in our likeness of Christ. And that means as a church, we should always be becoming the church who God would have us to be. And if we're not changing in the likeness of Christ, we're not following Him. So imagine if, having come to know Jesus as their king, these disciples, they just went back to their boats and the world would be a very different place, right? If, they had, if that had happened instead, they followed Jesus day by day by day. Even though they had no idea where it would lead, even to their death, following Jesus changes us like them. And the disciples grew in their understanding of God's demand on their lives. They listened and were obedient to his call and their following wasn't dependent upon knowing his plan. It was dependent upon knowing the person of Jesus. So if you're anything like me, when you consider how radical it is to be a follower of Jesus, it's so easy to be completely overwhelmed. It's easy to wonder if this is even doable. And there's great encouragement in the passage we've been looking at this whole time. It says, come and follow me, Jesus says, and I will make you fishers of men. We answer the call, but it's Jesus who enables us to follow him. Jesus says, I will make you fishers of men. The invitation to follow is accompanied by the equipping. With obedience and following comes the promise of provision. And we see that in the triumphant conclusion to the entire Gospel of Matthew. He says, Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Son, the Father, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. And remember, I'm with you always to the end of the age. In other words, Jesus calls and equips us with his very self. If you want to be a committed follower and not a casual follower, we must definitely have to respond to the call with a resounding yes to Jesus. But we also have to acknowledge that it's only in His strength that we can do it. And that means if you want to keep growing as a follower, we've got to keep nurturing our relationship with Him. We've got to decide as individuals and a church what sort of Christians we're going to be. Casual followers 
happy to tip our hat to God and when it suits us, or committed followers of Jesus who are ready to give everything for the one who left his Father in heaven and gave up everything, gave up his riches, gave up everything on the cross. Rescuing others through Jesus is God's great plan. And as God's people, aren't we called to share in this?